Good. So I'm Dan Freed, director of the CMSA, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to this installment of the Math Literature uh, Seminar Series, and I'll turn it over to the originator of that series, Yao. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, I'm glad to still join these Zoom meetings for me, and I start this, uh, initiate this uh, uh, series of talks about four years ago, uh, the aim is to bring in literature to scholars and also students. And we have brought in many uh, distinguished uh, speakers, uh, I guess including Dan, and many other uh, famous uh, mathematicians from Europe and also from Asia. And I'm glad that it has been doing very well, uh, despite the COVID. And I think uh, we have seen many uh, uh, writings. In fact, uh, after that, many people contribute essays on the literature. And I think it has been a great series of things. Although I retired last year, I still enjoy to listen to this uh, series of talks. And I think it's very useful because I personally learned a lot uh, in this uh, series of lectures. Some of them, uh, including uh, geometry, who I enjoy very much to listen to the experts on talking about the history. So, uh, I, well, now today we have another distinguished uh, uh, faculty, faculty from University of Chicago, which I uh, like to listen very much because the Hoff uh, argument has been around for such a long time. And I always like to uh, learn more detail about it. So. So we have uh, Professor Annie Wilkinson, who is going to talk about stretching and shrinking, 85 years of the Hoff argument. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yao. Uh, thank you for this invitation. Um, I'm very excited to speak here. Um, and uh, I've had a lot of good encounters with Tsinghua and with the people at Tsinghua and the students. And, um, I welcome all of you students who made it out on vacation um, to come to this talk at this very late hour. And um, welcome those of you who've made it at a very early hour here on the East Coast of the US. So um, I decided to choose the Hopf argument. Um, it's an argument that was developed by Eberhard Hopf. Note there are two Hopfs. There's Heinz Hopf and Eberhard. Um, this was when Eberhard was at the, uh, Harvard University in the 1930s. He had been brought there from uh, Germany by Birkhoff. Um, I want to explain the argument and some history and the role it plays in um, subsequent developments in mathematics. So the talk will be a lot of pictures because at this hour, um, I don't think anyone wants to be looking at too many formulas. Um, so um, please feel free to ask questions in the chat and Ben McKenna, who's helping out, will monitor the chat and let me know if there are any questions I need to answer. Um, so really the, the story, it goes back before Hobbes, and I'm going to start the story with Ludwig Boltzmann, who, um, as we know, is a physicist who studied um, thermodynamics and was interested in mathematically um, making precise a behavior that he hypothesized uh, in a model of gas. Um, and um, this is sort of the prelude or the introduction to his famous um, ergodic hypothesis, if you like. This is the background. So he starts to talk about ergodicity, which at the time was not a well-defined concept, um, but, but the setting is. So we imagine, we are to imagine a, a huge number of mechanical systems and they're all identical. 
um, in terms of the laws that they obey, the physical laws that they obey. And they all have a fixed energy. So we think of maybe a Hamiltonian system. And then we the different systems are different initial conditions in, in this fixed system, physical dynamical system. Um, and he asks us to imagine that we have some extremely different starting states. And what he hypothesized is, hypothesizes is that over time, these states, these states as they evolve will come to, in a probabilistic sense, resemble each other. And that's what he calls ergodicity. So here's a picture. It's not exactly concerning ergodicity, but it's a picture I took from Wikipedia of, of the model that Boltzmann was interested in. He called this the hard sphere gas model. And so it is modeled by a, a box. It could be two or three dimensions, or I suppose any dimensions. And the gas molecules are spheres, and they have some mass, and they bounce off of each other. There's no gravity, no external forces, and they just bounce off of each other elastically and against the walls of the box. Um, and as you see from this animation, um, if you start in what you would think of as a very atypical situation in which I've colored half of the molecules red and the other half gray, and you've put them in two separate sides of the box, that after some time as it evolves, it starts to look much more uniform. And that is this um, kind of phenomenon of ergodicity or, or mixing. And these are closely related phenomena. Um, and so the actual model that Boltzmann um, uh, developed um, was, it was a physical model, a Hamiltonian model, but it takes place in an extremely high dimensional phase space because every single sphere in that box of molecules, every single sphere has its own position and momentum. And so, you know, if you have, if you're in two dimensions and you have 20 um, molecules, each molecule has four dimensions. And so, you know, you have four to the, okay, four, to, four times 20, you have 80 dimensions in your phase space to analyze. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are approaches to understanding uh, this ideal gas. I mean, one, the, one can look at a limit where you let the number of particles sort of go to infinity and, and start studying distributions rather than, than the molecules themselves. But this is really a physical finite dimensional problem that Boltzmann had um, posed. Um, Sinai, quite some time later, uh, developed a, a simplified model um, very com complex in its own in its own right um, to model Boltzmann's hard sphere gas, and so he instead um, has takes the as one often does in uh, in uh, mathematical physics takes the position takes the the reference of one of the particles uh, here depicted in yellow, and one assumes that this particle doesn't affect the other particles. Uh, but merely is affected by them. And so maybe it's sort of massless, but it bounces off elastically all the other particles, which are spheres and are fixed. And we stay inside of this box. And so the evolution of a system like this, where a give, for a given starting position and direction and say fixed speed bounces around the box like this. And so here the state space is much smaller dimensional because we're just looking at one particle in two dimensions, and it has one degree of directional freedom because we're fixing the energy. So this is a three-dimensional phase space problem. Um, now, this model, which came much later in the 60s, um, is actually related to a much earlier system that was studied by, well, Hopp but others um, back around the turn of the 20th century. And so how we can see this, um, this is a little, um, this is a little contrived, but it, it's, I think, kind of informative. Hold on just one minute. Peter, do you mind closing that door? <laughs> I think it's informative. So here's our, maybe a box with just a single, this is called the scatterer, the single spherical obstacle. Here we're in dimension two. And so what we can do is we can take this um, kind of billiard table, if you like, 
and reflect it around its edges um, so that now we have four copies of the original uh, billiard table, two of which have the orientation reversed. Now, if we look at the this billiard bouncing Sinai uh, setup, um, we can look at the mirror trajectories in these four boxes, um, continuing trajectories um, in the appropriate boxes where needed. When you hit the edge, you have to go to the corresponding box that has the same orientation, or the appropriate orientation. So not the same, but the appropriate orientation. So if we start, there's a trajectory. The red one is the billiard trajectory, the Sinai trajectory. The white one is the reflected trajectory. And what I want you to notice is that um, in order to continue, I could continue this reflect this um, reflected system merely by identifying the top and bottom halves of these this larger box and the two sides of the larger box. And so I have completely mirrored the original dynamical system by another sort of billiard system in which trajectories go on straight lines until they bounce off scatterers. But now I'm no longer in a box, but I'm on a smooth manifold, a two-dimensional torus. So the CNI model is um, consists of, one can repose it, and this is the way CNI actually poses it, as a problem of um, uh, a particle kind of bouncing inside of uh, a torus against these spherical uh, scatterers. And so, <clears throat> Now I would like to propose that we um, get rid of those spherical scatterers as well. And so to do this, I glue two copies of the Sinai billiard table, one of them a reflection of the other, around those circles and see how the dynamics continues in that case. Um, and so uh, here we see the holes just being, for illustrative pur purposes, being pulled out and then being glued together. And then what is the resulting object? Well, it's a torus, uh, a higher genus, two tori glued along these four tubes. And so I believe this is a genus five torus, or genus five surface, I use the term. And so now what is the geodesic flow, or I'm sorry, what is uh, Sinai's flow look like? Well, you can imagine those places where I have glued the circles together if we wanted to think of this as a manifold with a metric, that's a very highly singular, uh, it's not Romanian in any way, but it's sort of this highly singular locus in which um, things disperse very quickly. And so if you like, you can think of this as a torus that has, or a genus five surface that has zero curvature everywhere, except at these four circles where it sort of has infinite negative curvature. And so the, the dynamics look something like this. Okay, so I will return to this as an example like this, uh, but I want to say something a little more about the Sinai model. So in the actual phase space, um, which here we can, so we can actually um, uh, model this, a two-dimensional slice of this by looking at, um, the set of tangent direction or set of uh, unit directions um, emanating from the central scatterer. So in this system, there's sort of four different regions <clears throat> in which we see, uh, these are infinitesimal regions about a point in which we see um, different kinds of behaviors. And I will return more rigorously to this, but merely I just want to suggest that if you, sort of look at one of these central, um, these this kind of central orbit, and you change the orbit just a little bit um, <clears throat> spatially while keeping the angle fixed, um, you're going to, when you bounce off the scatterer, these two trajectories are going to kind of get closer to each other. Whereas if you change the angle a little bit, um, maybe even just keeping the position fixed, I could have, and you come out, you're going to um, see some expansion in the distance between these two trajectories. 
And this is a phenomenon called hyperbolicity. And this is what this talk is about. Okay, so what is the what does Boltzmann's ergodic hypothesis say? Well, this is concerning the hard sphere gas. He says what it would say is consider a random arrangement of molecules or balls with their um, with their velocities uh, inside of a box. So random being chosen uniformly uh, with respect to the volume of that phase space, which is um, a solid a solid torus, right? or topologically a solid torus. So imagine that. So that configuration should be what, if I start with any configuration, like the highly non-random one where maybe they're all pointing in the same direction, right? That's a, you take something highly non-random, maybe you randomize it a little bit, and then as you let time evolve, it should look like this. And how do you kind of measure randomness? Well, you measure it by saying, if I start at a given time and I wait long enough, uh, then um, it should be equidistributed with respect to this volume. So if I look in different sort of windows in the phase space, so here I've just drawn a spatial window. I should also be drawing a directional window. Um, the probability uh, that I visit this region um, over time, sort of measured over time, should be proportional to the volume of this region. Um, in, in, in uh, yes, of this region. So this, um, so this would be like a highly probable outcome because, as you see, as I sample different, at least spatially, and seems directionally as well, as I sample different regions, um, it, th this kind of configuration. If you land in this configuration, you've sampled. You, you're you're pretty uh, typical in that sense. Um, Whereas this um, would be a highly unlikely, a highly unlikely uh, configuration uh, to find yourself in because, in fact, you know, there's this region that has high volume, which is occupied by very little um, spatially uh, of, of these um, spheres. Um, and so you would expect to see this configuration over time in an extremely small percentage of the time. So that's roughly the ergodic hypothesis. Um, and um, did I want to say something? I feel like I wanted to say something else, but I don't remember what it was. So anyway, this this would be highly unlikely. And so, I uh, guess, so Boltzmann was wanted things over time. So he imagined um, that these uh, physical systems like this um, would evolve over very, very fast time scales. And so um, if things were truly just visiting every possible state over time, then you could extract from a gas, which is a highly kinetic thing, you could extract uh, static quantities such as temperature, which are something that you measure just as a, a function of a, a fixed configuration, okay? So that was his interest. That roughly is the ergodic hypothesis is that these systems should mix like this. So now let me tell you rigorously what ergodic is. So you've noticed I have not actually quoted Boltzmann um, because if you look at his quotes, it's sort of hard to recognize what's going on um, in his hypothesis. Um, and so part of the question um, kind of left by this hypothesis at the beginning of the 20th century is what exactly mathematically is ergodicity? Um, what's a good definition that would actually capture what um, what uh, Boltzmann was interested in? He thought it would be a typical situation. So this was this problem was solved by uh, first by von Neumann uh, in the 1930s, but then subsequently, not much long afterwards, by um, George Burkhoff at Harvard and also, um, and I'm forgetting his last name, Carloman in Sweden actually sort of did this around the same time. Um, so here's the definition they come up with, which doesn't look like the definition um, we saw that, that I was describing before. 
So um, we fix a measure space, a probability space, and I haven't written down what the probability space is. Let's just assume it's a manifold. Um, it's more general than this, but assume we have a manifold and it has finite volume. So for example, it's compact. Um, and assume that we have an evolution. Here I'm writing this time evolution. You could think of it as just F as being kind of a discrete time evolution of the flow that I described before. So I assume I have a dynamical system on this closed manifold M um, and it preserves volume. So if I have a set and I apply F to it, or maybe I have to apply F inverse to be categorically correct um, and, and the volume doesn't change, but if it's time reversible, it's the same as just saying volume days. So things can, shape-wise can, evolve in very complicated ways but but it's incompressible there's no the volume cannot uh, of of a sub region cannot be collapsed in any way okay so that's that's the actual setting in which ergodic theory takes place and then here's the definition of ergodicity so it just says it's an it's a simple irreducibility condition it just says that there are no invariant subsets of the system so if I have a subset, um, I could have, I guess, probably written f of a equals a in this case as well. Um, but I, if I have a subset of my system, maybe I'll draw this in white. So here's M. And if I have, well, I can't have this. I can't have some positive measure, positive volume subset of the system that's fixed by the system. Okay, That's not ergodicity. So it's the complement of that. There's no way to find another measure preserving system, subsystem of my system. So what does that have to do with Boltzmann's hypothesis? Well, the connection is the ergodic theorems of von Neumann and burkhoff karleman um, And here's the, the statement minus some quantifiers. Here's the statement of the theorem, um, uh, one one form of the theorem minus quantifier. So what it says, um, and I'll illustrate this on the next slide. Well, in words, and this is how it's often quoted, time averages equal space averages. And it just means this over on this side is sort of the percentage or ratio, the, 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 the percentage, or, sorry, the ratio of time, the portion of time in the first n iterates, the first, um, this, by the way, f to the k indicates that I've composed f with itself k times and represents um, the evolution of a starting state x after k iterates. So here x in the earlier application would be some configuration, starting configuration of spheres uh, with their velocities. Okay, whoops, I lost my pencil, okay. So um, this, uh, this is the proportion of, of the orbit of X uh, that's spent in uh, a, a set A. And over time, this should converge to the proportion of the set that, that takes up M, okay, the volume. And so that's Burkhoff's ergodic theorem. And so here are the quantifiers. For any measurable set A, this is true for almost every X with respect to volume. Okay, so it can't, you, you don't want to force this to happen to every X or it'll never actually happen at all. <laughs> so, um, but this is a good, so it says almost every starting configuration is going to do exactly what Burkhoff wants. Uh, I'm sorry, what Boltzmann wants. Okay. Um, and here's a picture um, of exactly that. There's a point and it's evolving Maybe we're sampling. So it's evolving over time. And here's, say, x, here's f of x, f of f of x, f squared of x, f cubed, and so on. And if one counts the number of visits, and it should, you know, in this picture, for example, it would be approximately, say, one sixth of the time it'll spend in that set A. So that's ergodicity. All right. So now we can get to Hopp's argument. So in the abstract for my talk, I mentioned three theorems whose proofs, who have proofs that use Hopp's argument. Um, they, they don't 
necessarily need Hobbes argument, but um, they profit from the existence of, of Hobbes argument. And the first is sort of the original argument of Hobbes, uh, um, which is later generalized in 1967 by uh, Dmitry Nosov. So um, I call this the Hobbes and Nosov theorem. Um, let me tell you about the context for this theorem. Okay, so <clears throat> the context of this theorem um, was the study initially was the study of hyperbolic surfaces. So what's a hyperbolic surface? Um, one starts with the hyperbolic plane, or this is the disk model. You could also model hyperbolic space by the upper half plane in R2 with the metric ds squared equals dx squared plus dy squared <clears throat> over y <clears throat> squared. Um, and in the hyperbolic plane, um, geodesics um, are arcs of circles or lines, which are conformally circles, if you put this on the Riemann sphere, that are perpendicular to the boundary, which is not part of hyperbolic space. Um, so here in the disk model, which is conformally equivalent, I've drawn a bunch of, um, depicted a bunch of hyperbolic geodesics. And um, one can, um, there are in fact many ways to do this, to take, for example, uh, an, a hyperbolic octagon, sorry for my shaky handwriting, so an octagon whose edges are geodesics, um, and you can tile um, the hyperbolic plane, if, if you choose the, some of these angles to be two pi, you can tile the hyperbolic plane with these um, octagons and using hyperbolic isometries, gluing appropriately. So one isometry would glue this geodesic to this geodesic. Using appropriate isometries, one arrives at a surface of higher genus. And in fact, um, any surface of genus at least two um, carries a hyperbolic, carries a whole uh, 6G minus six dimensional space of hyperbolic metrics, in fact. So um, where G is the genus. Um, so I've depicted one example here, and after these identifications, you get a genus two surface. Now, of course, the, the genus two surface that one obtains um, is not embeddable in two dimension and three dimensions, the way I've depicted this, because hyperbolic space has the property that at every point, well, hyperbolic two space has a property, every point the sectional curvature is minus one, if you fix the metric, I think this is the right metric, the, the, um, the curvature is minus one. And in higher dimensions, the sectional curvatures are all minus one, they're constant. And so <clears throat> if you were actually in hyperbolic space, you could imagine every point that you were uh, at would look like you were, you're living on a saddle, okay, uh, dimension two. So it's, it's clearly way too crinkly to depict in, in three dimensions. But, um, but anyway, topologically, this is what you would get. And um, Poincaré uh, initiated, and also Fuchs and Klein in higher dimensions uh, in the latter part of the 19th century started studying uh, the fundamental, the representations of the fundamental groups of these manifolds that carried hyperbolic structure. So the representations of their fundamental groups as groups of isometries. Um, and in particular, they were very interested in um, not just in compact manifolds, but they were very interested in looking at the boundary of the hyperbolic space, which is not part of hyperbolic space, and studying, you know, kind of um, studying the dynamics of the action of the fundamental group on the boundary. Um, and like, for example, Marston Morse. Um, or no, sorry, it was Artin, but Morse as well, um, you know, coded, used use this boundary to, to obtain a coding of geodesics. Anyway, so it's getting a little beyond, beyond what I'm about to say. So um, there was these surfaces uh, and people were interested in the geodesics on these surfaces. Um, 
And what comes with, in fact, any Romanian manifold is a dynamical system. So this is a wonderful fact. Um, and in fact, it's something I've I'm exploring in a book that I'm writing right now, which is hopefully near and complete completion. So given a hyperbolic or given, sorry, a Romanian manifold, one can associate to it a dynamical system, canonical dynamical system called the geodesic flow. Okay. <clears throat> so for example, here's a surface and let me depict what the geodesic flow does. So what is the phase space of the geodesic flow? Well, it's very similar to the phase space of, say, a billiard table that we talked about before. It's the unit tangent bundle to the surface. So this is a Romanian manifold. And I just look at the set of vectors that are tangent to the manifold but have length one. Okay. So what does the geodesic flow do? This is one way of describing it. There's many ways. Um, well, it takes a vector inside of this unit tangent bundle. Um, and where does it go after time t? What's the time t transformation? Well, I draw the geodesic, the unique unit speed geodesic determined by v. I go, okay, so here the velocity is 1, so I don't really need this t times the length of v, because that's just t. So I go a distance t, well, in that direction. Of course, if t is negative, you just go in the backwards direction. And then I take the tangent vector at that point in the geodesic. And that's the image of v under the geodesic flow. And as it turns out, the dynamics of the geodesic flow are closely related to the geometry uh, of the underlying manifold. Um, and um, so this geodesic flow had been studied again at the beginning of the um, uh, beginning of the 20th century by not just Hopf, but Adamar um, and others. Um, and they were interested in sort of the dynamical properties of this and how it's reflected in properties, geometric properties of the underlying manifold. Um, and so if the manifold happens to be a hyperbolic manifold, um, then you can lift the geodesic flow on the manifold to the unit tangent bundle to the hyperbolic base. Okay? And so, um, Again, remember geodesics in hyperbolic space are just arcs of circles that are tangent to the boundary. And so this is what, whoops. Well, that is what, let me see if I can go back without, uh, I'm trying to remember how to go back on this. A little problem, I don't remember. I'm going to have to do this, okay. So that is, um, that is how you lift it. And you see, um, of course, this this green line, it looks unit speed to our Euclidean eyes, but in the hyperbolic metric, um, in fact, this is going faster and faster and faster and faster as, as we approach the boundary. Um, and every time it um, crosses, you know, you could just, just as before um, with our Sinai, Thing, you could actually, you know, go back to the corresponding side, and I forget which side corresponds, and and you know reproduce the flow just on the uh, fundamental domain if you wanted. Okay, so the Hopf and Ossoff theorem concerns not just hyperbolic manifolds, but any manifold, closed manifold, of um, closed manifold whose sectional curvatures are all negative. Um, Hopf dealt with surfaces. Prior to Hopf, Adamar had studied hyperbolic surfaces, hyperbolic manifolds. Um, so what's the difference? What's special about Hopf's argument? What's different about a negative? What's so different? Uh, what's the big difference between a negatively curved manifold and a hyper? Symbolic manifold. Well, of course, in higher dimensions, not all negatively curved manifolds are even the same manifolds as hyperbolic manifolds, as we know. But um, 
What's the difference is that um, an arbitrary negatively curved surface is um, not likely, uh, well, it doesn't have constant curvature. And so the geodesic flow cannot be described in algebraic terms. So on hyperbolic surfaces, the geodesic flow is actually just a diagonal flow left multiplication by, or left to right, depending, I guess, on which side you quotient, but um, a quotient of SL2R, or in fact, I guess PSL2R, but by a discrete subgroup. And so this is just left translation. And it, it's very algebraic in nature, and you can use a lot of algebraic tech tricks. Also, there's no distortion. So these, so we call these linear systems, even though they're not linear. And well, dynamics such as the hard sphere gas problem are highly nonlinear. And so what Hopf found was an argument. I uh, still haven't told you what it is. It's essentially an argument for ergodicity that works in nonlinear settings, and it's a robust argument. And so it allows you to um, perturb, for example, away from hyperbolic systems in particular. So what does the theorem say? Here's how I stated it in my abstract. I stated it as follows. I said, almost every geodesic is directionally equidistributed. So all I meant by that is if I pick at random on one of these manifolds, I pick a direction at random and I follow the unique infinite possibly probably infinite geodesic that's um, determined by that direction, it will, of course, I'm getting my quantifiers a little off here. So I really should say this in another way, but let, let me say it in the correct way. If I take any set of um, subset of the manifold of positive volume, and I take a set of directions over that with positive measure in the circle. So any positive measure subset of the unit tangent bundle, um, and I take a geodesic or I take a direction at random, then that geodesic will visit that set proportional to its volume inside of the unit tangent bundle. So this is really a statement of ergodicity, but you can state it without talking about ergodicity of the geodesic flow, but you can state it without talking about um, about the geodesic flow at all. So it's a strong statement. It says not only is every, not only is almost every geodesic dense in the manifold, that's implied, not only is almost every geodesic equally distributed within the manifold, which is also true, but it's actually equally distributed inside of the unit tangent bundle. So, um, so this is this is the theorem. Okay, so that's Hopf's argument, and I will now explain from 1939. Why is there such? What is this? Well, this is Anosov's generalization to higher dimensions. So, and it kind of intervening here is a result by Sina in the 60s, um, but it wasn't completely general. So, in that case, he assumed that the the curvatures of the sectional curvatures of the manifold are negative, but also quarter pinched. And that is an assumption that implies that a very key element of the Hopf argument is smooth. There's a question answer, okay, I'm not gonna, yeah, is smooth. Um, so I might sort of be able to hint at this, but anyway, Anasov had a very big breakthrough and understanding really the situation in 1967, which allowed for breakthroughs in the ergodic hypothesis as well. Okay, so that's the theorem. So let me tell you about the Hopf argument. And so I'm going to give a toy model for the geodesic flow. Um, it, it's in some ways imperfect, but in other ways very good. Um, so the geodesic flow in, um, for a surface of negative curvature. If you look inside the unit tangent bundle, you'll see the following kind of picture. You see the direction of the flow, and then you'll see kind of through every point, this is meaning every tangent vector, 
this is in the inner tangent bundle, you'll see a pair of curves. And these curves in the hyperbolic, in the hyperbolic case, these curves actually are projecting, if I draw a picture, these two curves are projecting to things called horospheres. Um, if I were to do my colors right, let's see. Oh, here's, this corresponds to this point right here. And this is its the trajectory of this point, the orbit of this point under the geodesic flow. And then this curve, I've drawn a curve in the hyperbolic plane. So this is lifting now to the hyperbolic plane. In the unit tangent bundle, I can take the unit normals to that circle tangent to the infinity, tangent to infinity, and I can also take some unit normals, but pointing outwards to that circle. And these are three curves inside of the unit tangent bundle of the surface. So infinite or on a local scale, this is what they look like inside the unit tangent bundle. And as we flow, these yellow, by the geodesic flow, these yellow vectors are going to converge over time. They get closer and closer over time. Whereas these green vectors are going to diverge in forward time. But in backwards time, if we follow their trajectories under the flow, they converge to, they converge to the blue trajectory. And so this, what I've called yellow, this is um, a stable direction for the flow. In fact, it's a stable curve in this picture. And this is an unstable curve. And we have this at every point and they are transverse. And over time, points on the stable curve flow together uh, and in backwards time, points in the unstable curve flow together toward the backward orbit. So here's uh, a toy model um, that Anasov put in a book of his with, um, Anasov, sorry, Arnold, put in a big book of his with Aves. Um, it's a great book, I recommend it. Um, and it's just the linear action of a map, uh, I think 2111, I hope that that's what this picture is, uh, on the plane, so it acts linear on the plane, it preserves the integer lattice, and so it induces a map on this two-dimensional torus. And I want to show you what this looks like. So here's a fundamental domain for the torus. Um, this is the image, that purple thing is the image of that fundamental domain under the linear map to 111, the parallelogram, and then it's reassembled. You reassemble it um, in the fundamental domain, you can sort of see what it's doing. It's not homotopic to the identity, unlike the geodesic flow, but you can actually embed it in a flow so that transversely, it's going to look very much like the geodesic flow, but it's a map. And to illustrate what this map does, well, um, uh, Arnold um, famously drew a picture of a cat in the fundamental domain, just a, a cute little um, cat. Okay. Draw a cat. And then he iterated the cat and he showed what happens to the cat. So it's called the cat map. So um, Josh Pay, who's a grad student at Penn State and very, um, well, I'll say more later, who helped me out with some of these illustrations. Um, he um, drew, drew an animation of the cat map, um, but instead of using a cat, so I want to emphasize this is a younger person. Um, instead of using a cat, he used uh, Taylor Swift. So let's see what happens to Taylor Swift. Um, over time, if you iterate, so that's Taylor Swift under one iteration, two iterations, and so on. So as we can observe, um, this is highly unnecessary because you're all mathematicians, but it's kind of fun. Um, you can observe what happens to points on this torus under iterations of the cat map. Namely, um, everything is getting really stretched out in one direction. Um, and in fact, it's getting also very contracted in a complementary direction. Now, what are these two directions? 
these two directions are parallel to the eigenspaces of this, what we call this matrix here. So this is the um, expanding eigendirection, and this is its contracting eigendirection. So it has two eigenvalues, neither one it has absolute value one. Okay, so this is exactly the model. This is called hyperbolicity, or now it's called a Nossoff condition. And you can have this condition for either a diffeomorphism or a flow. Um, this is the property that geodesic flows and negative curvature have. And here's roughly why they are ergodic. So this is the hot argument. So um, I stated this because um, I didn't want to go into the proof at all. But um, I actually, you can, it's evident for um, hyperbolic manifolds um, for variable negative curvature. So where you go nonlinear, it's a little less evident. But um, whenever you are in that situation, like either you have the cat map and you could perturb it if you want, or you're looking uh, at the geodesic flow and negative curvature um, and you look sort of transverse to the dynamics. Um, so this is really a picture for the cat map. Through every point, you have a stable manifold and an unstable manifold, and they have the property. So in this case, they're one dimensional and higher dimensions, they will be transverse. So the dimensions will add up to the dimension of the ambient space modulo the dynamics. And um, over time, um, these directions will be contracted and these will be expanded in forward time or backwards time, the opposite. And this is just illustrating a property of these Anosov systems that if you take two points close enough, um, the, un the stable of this will intersect transversely the unstable of this and vice versa. And then they call this local product structure. So it just reflects the uniformity of these foliations. Okay, so what is what are these foliations? They're called foliations, but what do these families of manifolds have to do with ergodicity? So this is the Hopf argument. And now I put the only formulas in my entire talk. Okay, so now just we're in an abstract system, right? So F, I should say now, F is just a measure preserving uh, dynamical system. So we have F, M to M, and let's assume that it preserves, um, oh, I see, I went off the page. Okay, so I have F from M to M, and I assume that F takes volume to volume. All right, and um, I fix, let's fix a continuous function on M, let's call it feet. And let's consider this following uh, measurable function that's defined everywhere. I made, I wanted it to be defined everywhere. So I took a limb soup. Um, and what is this? This is just the average values of the function along the orbit X. So for example, if phi were the characteristic function of a set, which of course isn't continuous, but gives you some idea, this would be the average number of visits to the set over time. Um, or at least the limb soup. Okay, so it's going to be a bounded quantity because phi is continuous. Um, so this is defined everywhere. It's a measurable function. Okay. Now, ergodicity is equivalent to the statement that this average is constant for any continuous function. Well, not quite constant. It's constant, and this is sort of key. This is the this is the this is the bugaboo. This is what makes everything difficult in smooth ergodic theory. So it's equivalent to saying that for every continuous function, this is constant almost everywhere. Okay, so this, this equivalence here um, follows from Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. Um, it even follows from von Neumann's ergodic theorem, which is a statement um, in, about operators in Hilbert space. So it's... Um, it's a very simple statement. So um, ergodicity, I mean, one direction that we have this implication, that is just the ergodic theorem. And this one's like a little bit of very basic functional analysis in, in, inside of L2 uh, of M. 
but and, and the fact that and it relies on the fact that m is separable okay so let's go to the next okay and so here's the here's what Hoff does is there a question that might be i should answer uh, you can probably finish the, the talking about the Hoff argument first and then maybe look at the question okay oh. yeah okay okay so let me remove all this junk from the slide okay so here's what Hopf does, just a simple, he goes backwards, okay? So you take the average of the same function and you take a limb soup again, and you take the average of the same function but backwards in time, okay? So the ergodic theorem, in fact, again, this ergodic theorem of von Neumann implies the two are equal almost everywhere. So roughly, why is this? This is because this forward average by the ergodic theorem, because F preserves volume, this is actually the projection of the function phi onto the space of F invariant functions in L2. And this is the projection, this is what the ergodic theorem says, this is the projection onto the space of F inverse invariant functions on L2. But F is invertible, forward invariants and backward invariants are the same. And so the projections are the same in L2. So they're almost everywhere the same. And this is sort of the key place where now we can bring in our foliations and get a complete Hopf argument. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'll remind you the, these two facts. And now I want to describe what the Hopf argument is. This is really the core of it. It's very simple. So it says, look, let's take a piece of this, take a point, and let's look at its stable manifold. So look at all the points that under forward time converge. And let's look at another point on the same stable manifold. And let's compare these forward averages at these two points. Well, that amounts to comparing the values of this continuous function phi as these two points travel down the orbit. Well, these values converge to each other, and this implies that if that whatever value I get for x is going to be the same for any other point on the um, the same stable manifold, okay? So that implies that phi plus is constant. And now I think you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the unstable manifold and I'm going to go instead backwards in time. And I'd again take two points and backwards in time. So I should say phi is constant on WS manifolds. Just to be clear, I'm not saying it's constant. I'm saying it's constant on WS manifolds. And similarly, um, phi minus is constant on unstable manifolds, these manifolds that are contracted. And somehow now we want to put together, we have these manifolds on which phi minus is constant, and we have these manifolds on which phi plus is constant, and we want to Show that phi plus is constant, but we know that these two functions are like the same, right? By the ergodic theorem, they're equal. And then there's this nasty little thing almost everywhere, but let's ignore almost everywhere for a minute and finish the Hopf argument. Okay, so we have these two functions and we want to show they're constant. And I just want to note that the limiting functions phi plus and phi minus are not continuous anymore. They're, they're integrable, but they're not continuous. Or or an L2. So one, this is a caricature now of a proof, is to say, well, let's just take, I want to show phi is constant, phi plus is constant. So let's just take two points, x and y, in the manifold. Well, I showed you maybe x and y are far apart. But the manifold's connected. And so I showed you how I can get from any point to any other point by this local product structure, by intersecting stable and unstables. And so, well, by doing things locally, I can connect 
any two points with a long enough chain of stable and unstable manifolds on which uh, phi plus is constant and then phi minus is constant and so on. And so, well, it takes one value here, but then it has to take the same value here and then it takes the same value. And so the values at X and Y are the same for phi plus and phi minus and they're constant. Um, so that's one kind of approach. And so of course, what I've drawn is complete nonsense because you know every time we just have a path between X and Y we don't necessarily have the right to choose the the points where these, I mean, we do in this particular setting, you can sort of make this work, but these points where you um, switch from stable to unstable have to be points where, where these two agree. And that's only almost everywhere. And so um, the argument, this is not really a, a rigorous argument at all, but it can be made rigorous um, using um, density, Lebesgue density points. Um, and then here's the other argument, which is more like Hopf's argument, which is you pick, um, you pick, um, you, you work locally, uh, you pick, you take a point and you take its um, unstable manifold. And we know that phi minus is constant on that unstable manifold. And then I fill out a neighborhood at this point by stable manifolds on which I know phi plus is constant. And now I obtain a neighborhood of this point where phi plus is constant because phi plus and phi minus equal each other. Now, again, this is an almost everywhere statement and this is what makes things challenging. Um, and um, this, this argument can also be made precise and but it uses um in Hopf's case it uses the fact that these foliations are c1 so there's a c1 change of coordinates in which these look linear and that's enough to do a fubini type of argument to show locally at every point there's like a uniform neighborhood in which the function is almost everywhere constant so why don't i pause for questions i'm not anywhere near through this so i'm gonna have to just but this is probably the important stuff anyway is to explain the argument one of the questions in the q a is um for hyperbolic surfaces the anosov splitting of the tangent bundle seems to come from hora cycles where does the mm -hmm. anosov splitting come from in the case of variable negative curvature um it also comes actually from hora cycles and hora spheres but you have to define them properly so, um, and if you think about in the hyperbolic plane, a horror cycle is just a limit of larger and larger circles centered down. I take a geodesic, I take a circle, I take larger and larger circles centered down that geodesic. As I go to infinity, I get a horror sphere or a horror circle, right, in dimension two. In variable negative curvature, I do exactly the same thing. I take a limit of circles and it converges to something. So that's one way to see it geometrically. There's also a way just based on this infinitesimal and also condition that you can define them. Um, thank you, check that. There's a joke about Taylor Swift in the chat. Um, someone asked earlier, is, is negative Ricci possible? No, it's, it's, it, it's no longer a, a general statement. I mean, it's false. You can have negative Ricci curvature without, um, Ergodic geodesic flow, I believe. Yeah. Uh, those are all the questions for the moment. So, um, so I'm almost through my first hour. So I don't, I, I'm not going to do everything that I plan to do. I'll just sample a few things. Um, so, but this is the main theorem I wanted to talk about. Um, and so this proves um, that this geodesic flow is ergodic. Um, and I can now just very sort of briefly survey some other things. Um, so I, I think the thing that's expendable in this talk right now is Mostow rigidity. I, I'm sorry for those of you fans of Mostow rigidity, but I can at least state, you know, the um, the idea, what's going on. So Mostow rigidity is a statement. Well, it's there, there are more general statements um, proved not just by Mostow, but um, it's a statement about hyperbolic manifolds of dimensions three and higher, um, closed hyperbolic manifolds. And so here's a model of hyperbolic three space 
Um, on the right is um, summarizes a, a theorem of Thurston about one way how topologically you can obtain hyperbolic three manifolds, and it's actually sort of in some sense the only way you can get a closed hyperbolic three manifold. But I won't say anything about that. Um, and then Moscow's theorem uh, states that unlike so remember I said for a hyperbolic surface. If genus G, there's a six G minus six dimensional space of ways that you can change the hyperbolic structure on a fixed surface, a connected space. In higher dimensions, it is completely false. It's a zero dimensional space. And so this says, um, basically, if I have two hyperbolic, closed hyperbolic manifolds, and even I just have, say, an isomorphism between their fundamental groups, um, that implies their homotopy equivalent, and Mostow um, concludes that, in fact, these two manifolds are isometric. So there is only one hyperbolic manifold in a fixed topological class. That's a pretty strong theorem. And Mostow's, and I hope I'm getting this right, so Mostow's original proof, I believe, actually used the Hopf argument. It's not a necessary, it's not necessary to prove Mostow's theorem. But this is sort of a key step uh, in the proof where um, ergodicity of the geodesic flow is used. Um, and what does this depict? Well, let's see. So it depicts the following, and I'm just going to say it in words. I have my two hyperbolic manifolds. I have a homotopy equivalence. I lift it to the universal covers, so hyperbolic end space. Okay, well here, let's do this in dimension three, so hyperbolic three space. So you can show that we this homotopy equivalence, which is a gamma equivariant map, because M is compact, M and N are compact, it's what's called a quasi-isometry. So it's a kind of like a bounded distance from an isometry sort of thing. And quasi-isometric, it's not bounded distance, sorry, it's up to some scaling factors. Um, it's sort of Lipschitz on the large is what it implies. And um, this means that it induces a map, which I'm calling F, on the boundary spheres, which is quasi-conformal, which means it almost kind of preserves circles. Or in other words, what it says, in fact, Rigorously is if I take a field, I take the standard conformal structure on a sphere, in this case pictured by a field of circles, and I push this forward by F, and again, this, there's like a differentiability almost everywhere, um, I get, um, I get uh, this bounded family of um, ellipses um, with bounded eccentricity. So that's the, the quasi-conformal part of it. And we have, these are the actions of the fundamental group on the universal cover, gamma one and gamma two. And um, these actions, because the geodesic flow is ergodic because of Hopf, these actions are also ergodic. So that's the connection, is the ergodicity of the geodesic flow implies ergodicity of the actions of these fundamental groups. And from this, you can show, for example, so th that means that this sort of field of ellipses is, is almost everywhere preserved by the ergodic action of gamma two. And then ergodicity implies that in fact, the dilatation, that is this ratio between lengths of axes has to be constant. And so then you have to show that that constant is one, then you get a map that's quasi, that's sorry, conformal almost everywhere. And then you show that it's conformal by some more analysis and then it, goes inside and gives you an isometry. Okay, I actually said the whole argument. So I wanna quickly revisit the ergodic hypothesis. Um, and there's three, there's kind of several forms in which you could visit it. So the first is kind of Sinai's formulation, which is often called the boltzmann Sinai ergodic hypothesis. And it was formulated by Sinai in 1963. So he says, take any torus of any dimension and take k um, hard round spheres of identical size, um, you have to rule out sort of like an obvious condition to rule out if the sphere is very small, then you clearly, oh no, it doesn't matter. You don't have to rule that out. 
take it back. Um, and then the resulting system is ergodic. So that's what he um, conjectured. And he proved this um, for this table right here, where we have exactly one scatterer, so to speak, uh, inside of this torus. So it's a little different than the billiard, but, um, and, but his method, so he proved this in 1970, and notably this is post Anosov. This is because Anosov, you need his technology. And he introduced a method called hot chains to do it. Um, the difficulty in this problem is that this is singular. So remember when I drew this on a surface, those circles sort of had infinite negative curvature. They're discontinuities in the system and the derivative blows up in places. Um, so he introduced a, a, an argument for local er ergodicity similar to the one I drew, the second one I drew. And then this has been generalized considerably in subsequent years by um, um, the main player is um, Nando Shimani. Um, and it's basically been proved in general for generic configurations, but it's, it's, it's a ch very challenging technical problem, in fact. So here's another version. Um, it's a continuous ergodic hypothesis. And I put the first picture of mathematicians in this because this is um, uh, John Oxby and Stan Ulam, who were at Harvard in uh, the 1930s, thanks to Burkhoff. Um, and I mean, Ulam's well known for his work in physics. Um, so what they proved, they were interested actually in sort of set theoretic questions, but they were interested in the question, was there a topological obstruction to ergodicity? Like, does every closed manifold uh, admit an ergodic system? Um, they focused on um, homeomorphisms, so just continuous systems, and they were able to prove that every manifold admits such a system. But the way they did this was using the bare category theorem. So I'd like to say, you know, they produced it with their bare, you can produce it with your bare hands or you can produce it with your bare hands. So they actually showed that generically in the sense of bare, every volume preserving homeomorphism of a connected manifold, closed manifold is ergodic. Um, so this is, this is great. There's some kind of indication that maybe it's a very generic property. Um, but this argument does not use the hot, this is not a hot, this is a marriage lemma. This is almost a combinatorial statement about breaking your manifold up into little pieces and just kind of passing them around and doing it in some way that fills up the space. Um, and in fact, um, th there is no smooth analog. And that's because of uh, KAM, which is um, which was a theory developed first by Coleman Goroff and then Arnold and then Moser, um, like in the 50s, starting in the 50s. And what is what are KAM phenomena? Well, here's an illustration of um, a, a illustration of the diffeomorphism area preserving on the torus, and um, this is an elliptic fixed point, and um, there are many circles, in fact, a positive measure set of invariant circles enclosing this point. Um, but not everything, uh, you know, you could pick out a, a, a sub measure. You know, you can pick out some intermediate measure set of invariant circles, so it's not ergodic. I mean, you can also observe that even one circle separates the manifold into two pieces, so it can't be ergodic. But this, this persists in higher dimensions uh, for symplectic systems and even for volume preserving systems. Um, and this, if you perturb a system like this within inside of the <clears throat> category of smooth area preserving systems, you continue to have this phenomenon. It's a robust phenomenon. It's a, I guess on surfaces, it's a C3 robust phenomenon. And in general, it's a CR, depending on the dimension of the manifold, robust phenomenon. And so as Kolmogorov, when he was announcing the discovery of this result, basically said <clears throat> that um, there, there, should, there cannot be any ergodic um, hypothesis and um, maybe just ignore the words about this. But the point is, Kolmogorov and Arnold worked with analytic systems and later Moser, worked with systems with lower smoothness. And so um, there is no uh, ergodic hypothesis, but you can still, and this is a huge part of my work, is to try to modify it so that it's correct. 
So there's some directions in which one can modify it. Oh, by the way, so for analytic systems, one might conjecture, for example, on surfaces, preserving area that you have a picture, something like this, which is you know places where you have kind of these KAM phenomenon. And then everything kind of, and by the way, the picture inside of here is insanely complicated. It's not just circles surrounding. And then surrounded by sort of these ergodic seas. So that might be a conjectural, it is a conjectural picture. Completely no one knows how to prove it for surfaces even for analytic maps. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to end on is what I would call C1 ergodic hypothesis. Um, this goes back to the work of, to an ICM address of Ricardo Magnier in 1983, where he said, well, let's, instead of looking at C0 continuous things, let's look at C1 diffeomorphisms. And maybe there is hope, you know, it's not C3. And in fact, he proved a really strong, nice thing about the C1. It's about very much about the C1 topology on manifolds. He proved that the C1 generic volume preserving diffeomorphism of a surface is either a really strong a dichotomy, either it's actually a Nossoff, in which case it's ergodic. So a Nossoff meaning like the cat map, literally actually, or it's very, there's like no expansion at all with respect to volume. It's the opposite. So one way of saying this is that you have a dichotomy between zero entropy and the Anosov condition in the C1 topology on surfaces. This was generalized by Hanna Rodriguez Hertz in 2012 to three manifolds. And then um, with Arturo Avila and Sylvain Provisier, we proved uh, a complete generalization for volume preserving manifolds in 2016. Um, the arguments here, how they go, is to show that generically, if you have like a little bit of expansion, you can blow it up, expansion and contraction, you can sort of blow it up to have it almost everywhere. In dimension two, that has a very strong implication and the higher dimensions, less strong. But then once we have this, we kind of have non-uniformly little hot pictures and we can do some kind of hot argument locally, the same kind, this crisscross. And then finally, this is the final thing that I mentioned in my um, abstract. Um, if instead you look at the class of symplectomorphisms, um, so Manier's result is for surfaces, so area preserving and symplectic are the same. Um, but he conjectured that for symplectomorphisms, there should be a direct analog of what he had in surfaces saying that C1 generically for symplectomorphisms, if you have positive entropy, again, you have to have a little bit of this stretching and shrinking. Um, then in fact, it's ergodic, but in fact, there's even a stronger property that it's partially hyperbolic. Well, it's not stronger than ergodicity, but there's a generalization of the Anosov condition to higher dimensions called partial hyperbolicity. And you can't you can't strengthen it beyond that because partial hyperbolicity it does not need to be an Ossoff, um, and partial hyperbolicity is um, it's very much like the Ossoff condition except in your um, tangent space you can have a direction it's not tangent to the dynamics but you can have directions maybe higher dimensional. Uh, where you don't see a uniform expansion or contraction. You just see a, a sort of a domination by the stable and unstable. And there's a property of these partially hyperbolic systems that is C1 generic among partially hyperbolic systems that I proved with Dima Dolgopia a long time ago that says if you take any two points, you can connect them by whoops, by a um, sequence of stable and unstable manifolds. And this is a property called accessibility. Um, notice there's other dimensions in the manifold. So you can't, if you wanted to do this kind of 
pots type of argument, it, it won't work. It won't fill up the space. But this other kind of pot argument has a chance of working. So what what uh, Artur and Sylvain and I did proved building heavily on work of Foki. We proved that if you have positive entropy, then you are partially hyperbolic, generically. And then um, for smooth, partially hyperbolic systems, um, you can, uh, you, Keith Burns and I proved that um, you can carry out this kind of hot argument where you just connect, you can't fill up the space because you have a, you know, this is at least two dimensional because it's symplectic, but you can, you can get from any point to any other point and you get ergodicity from a, a modified, a slightly different kind of hot argument. So that's where I'm going to end. Um, I really do want to thank Josh Pape. Um, so I am a procrastinator, like many people. And so at about five o'clock in the afternoon yesterday, I had made, I started to make my slides. <laughs> and by seven o'clock, I realized I had to do an animation where you glue together <laughs> two CI billiards. And I knew I'd be up all night. And so um, I wrote to Josh and he helped me out with some of these illustrations, including Taylor Swift. So that's where I'll end. Well, Greg, this is a beautiful talk. Thank you. Are there questions? There's, there's one question in the Q&A, which asks, um, is ergodicity possible with finitely many points of zero curvature and everything else is negative? but the curvature becomes zero very sharply. So the metric is allowed to be singular at points of zero curvature. Yes, yeah, so that's, yes, on surfaces, yes. In fact, um, if, you, if you have like finitely many points where you have zero curvature and negative curvature elsewhere, the geodesic flow remains in Ossoff. And so um, it is, there's, it is ergodic, but um, there's, a, there's a difficult question that's still open which is uh, take a, a, a surface of higher genus and just put an arbitrary metric of non-positive curvature uh, is the geodesic flow ergodic. And there were published proofs of this that relied on an incorrect argument elsewhere. Um, that was 40, 30, 40 years ago. And now, um, and it's still an open question. There's some results now. Um, thank you. One more uh, attendee asks, besides Hopf and Oxabi Ulam, are there any other standard arguments to prove ergodicity? May add that, of course, Oxabi Ulam has yet to work past C0. Right. Well, I, I should say there's an interesting, there are some interesting developments, which I don't fully, completely understand, um, to get ergodicity of a Nassau systems that doesn't that don't use the Hopf argument. Um, instead, they use micro local analysis and you need higher smoothness of the Anasov system, but they definitely bypass a sort of a very different nature. Um, and they're in their early stages, so they're not super powerful yet, but who knows. Um, in terms of ergodicity, I mean, to establish ergodicity, um, if you're looking at a very specific system, then you can find ways to prove ergodicity that kind of, you know, maybe are a little more ad hoc. But in terms of general mechanisms, there really aren't any others. So it's a good question. Um, thanks. You can, Sorry, if the manifold is not smooth, uh, just like metric space, which is hyperbolic line, are mm -hmm. there any similar theorems? Yeah, so you have to, um, there are some similar theorems. Um, a notable, uh, not quite about volume, but they use um, a hot type of argument. So there's some work of um, Harry Bray, where he studies um, kind of geodesic flows, for example, not nearly as, as abstract, but um, for Hilbert metrics. And so in this case, um, you use Hilbert geometry uh, mm -hmm. that modeled on some convex shape. 
and you, you have some loss of smoothness there. Um, so you can't, you don't really talk about volume, but you can talk about the measure of maximal entropy and get ergodicity via a Hopf type of argument there. Um, in general, yeah, you, it, it, the problem is that even this ergodicity argument of Hopf really requires not just that the diffeomorphism be C1, but that it be C2. So it's like to go even to do a half argument for C1. I mean, these genericity arguments you use as an intermediate step. There's some C2. You have to go to the smooth mm -hmm. systems. So, um, and it's all because of this property called absolute continuity of foliations that um, mm -hmm. were, was discovered by an also who established. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, great. In the Q&A, someone asks, um, is much known about the ergodicity hypothesis? Oh, okay, this is, I guess, the question of discrete systems um, where the action discretized flow satisfies some sort of regularity like by Lipschitz Smith or discrete analyticity. Yeah, that it's motivated by wanting to understand what to expect in terms of CAM or discrete approximations of analytic flows of manifolds. So I guess that's sort of like- Discrete approximations, CAM. Okay, so this is- not answering the question because I'm not totally, uh, I don't totally understand the question, but just, it, it made me think of something else, which is um, the thesis work of Federico Rodriguez Hertz, where he started with um, a partially hyperbolic, so now we go to partially. So when you have partial hyperbolicity, it allows for K and behavior in the center direction. Um, and actually going back before this, you could take a product of a system of KAM behavior with a system that's an Ossoff, it's in two dimensions, and you get a four dimensional symplectic system. And you can ask, you know, when you perturb this symplectically, which which wins, the non ergodicity or the, you know, and um, yeah, let Mike Shu and I showed you can do a C infinity small perturbation symplectically where it becomes stably ergodic. So it, it's not surprisingly, it's a much more powerful mechanism than KAM if, if you, you know, give a head-to-head -head battle. Um, Rodriguez Hertz's thesis used KAM theory to prove stable ergodicity uh, when you don't have even this accessibility property. So it's, um, it's an interesting use of KAM to prove ergodicity. But, Um, thank you. Someone asks, how is C1 of foliation needed in, in Hopf's argument? In the variable mm. negative curvature case, one may only obtain C0 transversely. Mm. Well, uh, correct. But on surfaces for variable negative curvature, you obtain C1 transversely. So it's true in general that you only obtain transverse holder continuity in negative curvature. Except if, I'm sorry, oh, except if the curvature is quarter pinched, and then you do get C1, tra uh, C1 um, transverse behavior. But it, it, you have to use it or something to replace it. And what replaces it is transverse absolute continuity. And the reason is it, it's sort of this little Fubini argument where you have these basically you know that you have a function it's used several times in the argument but let's even simplify it down just one part of the argument i have a function that's constant if i take almost any point in the square i know that the function is constant through that curve through that point can i conclude that the function is constant well yes by fubini's theorem if the system of curves is just these lines and if you have a c1 foliation you can do a c1 change of coordinate so it looks like this a diffio and so you can apply fubini over here and then bring it back but in general you can have i should have kept a picture of this so th there's a phenomenon and it occurs in partially hyperbolic dynamics um, of what's called pathological foliations and pathological, for example, you can construct um, an invariant foliation. It's not stable or unstable in the square. 
where you have a full measure subset of the square, um, but it meets each leaf at, and at most finitely many points. Some, you can do it with one point. And so um, clearly in this case that it's Fubini's nightmare, it's the opposite. It's a foliation with like smooth leaves. It looks great, but you, you can't do that type of argument. So that's where this absolute continuity. So Mike Shub and I proved that this can happen in a stable way. In fact, I've done quite a bit of work because this phenomenon has some interesting consequences, rigidity type consequences. But anyway, yeah, so um, so you're right. You need something if you're going to do Fubini and it's called absolute continuity and it says Basically, you can do Fubini with the foliation. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. So someone asked, you mentioned uh, ergodicity of geodesic flow of non-positively curved surface is not known. They asked, what if the mm -hmm. curvature is controlled between two negative constants? Is that still open? Well, and then Josh, no, Josh no. Pike is, sorry, go ahead. Well, that's negative curvature, so. Right, okay. So, um, yes. Yeah. So then Josh Pike in the chat added that he thinks for the very, uh, for, sorry, for the negative variable curvature, uh, many relevant things have been produced by Boris Hasselblad and his PhD students. Um, for non-positive curvature, even for the most basic questions, you can call it a question of Gromov or Barago or Perelman, it's very hard. Wait, which, but which question is that? Um, sorry. Well, which, so the, which property is he talking about? I believe. Um, this has to do with the. Ergodicity of geodesic flow, I believe. Sorry. I think it's uh, something slightly different because in negative curvature, it's known for compact I, manifolds. It, it's always pinched between two negative constants if your manifolds compact the sectional curvature. So, yeah. Cool. Um, let me clear these out. Um, Someone asks, what happens for hyperbolic surfaces with boundary as one no longer works with the full unit tangent bundle? So the ergodic theory, okay, so you have to decide, like, what are you going to do when you hit the boundary? Are you going to reflect or in which case would you double the hyperbolic manifold? Can you double the hyperbolic manifold? Let's just say the whole theory of the ergodic theory, I've not answered the question of ergodic theory for hyperbolic manifolds in general. It's extremely interesting when your manifolds have infinite volume. And um, I would sort of think manifolds with boundary probably sort of fall into that category where you need to analyze. You have to do, and in fact, Hopf himself sort of gave uh, even more sort of uh, Kind of ways to classify the dynamics in infinite volume. Uh, and there are other measures which are important um, called Patterson-Sullivan measures on the boundary um, that aren't quite the analog of volume, but um, are very like meaningful. I mean, they are in some sense an analog, but they're like half-stroke measures. And you can ask about their ergodic properties. Great, thanks. Are there any other questions? All right. <clears throat> so thank you, Amy, for a beautiful talk. And I'll just mention the next talk in this series is March 20th. It'll be Cameron Gordon, who will be speaking both live at CMSA here and um, also online, Zoom. So Great. So thank you very much, Dan. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Beautiful talk. Thank you. Okay, bye.